right, here we go. Another episode of Canada on the Rocks. I am your host, Paddy Kudair, local realtor with Sutton Group Ottawa. And this is your show where every business has a voice. Uh, today, we're bringing on the show Patty Murphy from Youth Services Bureau of Ottawa. Patty, it, we've been trying to do this for, I believe now, a couple of weeks. We were on and off, on and off, trying to figure out the date, but finally we got it. I'm so glad that you're on the show. I'm so glad that I'm on here with you. Thank you. I'm, I'm so happy to have you. And I wanted to kind of uh, just give the folks that are watching the story of youth services, how it started, what got you going with it, and you know, just to tell us a little bit more. Beautiful. So the Youth Services Bureau has been operating in the Ottawa region for, it's now 64 years. So I have not been with the organization for 64 years, but it really has grown over the years based on the need of young people. So mm -hmm. we serve youth 12 and older, usually up to about 24, 25 years of age in four really unique areas. Mental health, which is core, of course we know is yeah. a really growing uh, concern. Shelters and housing, youth justice and employment. Uh, and employment is the only piece of our work that actually extends into adulthood as well. So we support people to wow. find, find work. So four different pillars of, of the services that you guys have. How did it come to fruition? Like what got the youth services started? I think back in the day, it was really just a concern for young people uh, who might have been, you know, back then, not so much street involved, mm -hmm. but not engaged, not engaged and perhaps not really feeling supported at home. And so for a lot of the young people that we serve, Fatty, you know, there's there's different reasons why they come through our doors if they are homeless it means that they need to be housed, they need to be seen, heard, housed and supported. And so I think back in the day, it was perhaps less so a struggle with homelessness, but definitely a sense of just not being engaged and not perhaps yeah. feeling that they were as supported in in uh, in their homes as, as they wanted to be. And it is such a crucial age that you guys are coming in like 12 to 24. That's really where most of the development happened. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times we we notice that this is the age where they can stray one way or another right that's right um what how come you started focusing on the 12 and above not necessarily below i guess tell me a little bit more yeah i think i mean having not been around at that time when the agency first started i think that was just seen as an, a need that age group um, and in fact, now, you know, 64 years later in 2024, we do work with a lot of agencies that support younger youth, but also the adult world. So when we have a young person engaged with us to support their mental wellness, when they age out of our programs, we don't want to just simply say, you know, all the best to you. We want to do a warm transfer so that they are going into the adult system, getting the support that they need. So I think it's it's really important, like you say, that 12 to 24, 25 age range, the human brain is still developing up until yeah. age 25 at least. That's what we know. And yes, you know, you think back to your own childhood, teenage years are not always easy, especially so going through the pandemic. You look at all the difficult things that we see on the news around the world. There's a lot of things that weigh very heavy on young minds and mm -hmm. young shoulders. And sometimes I think we forget about that. We as adults think about those things and they weigh heavy on us as well. But it does for a young person and they've got social media around them all the time. So they see that constantly. And I think it's it's important for us, basically, you know, all of us as a community to really see a young person when they're struggling to not see them as just Oh, geez. You know, but they're to, just checked out. Yeah. They're checked out. They should be doing this. I wish they would do that. You know, yeah. even as parents, sometimes we can we can kind of say those things. That's not what a young person needs. They really need to be seen. They need to be heard. They need to be walked alongside of, not in front. We don't want to walk in front of a young person. Mm -hmm. We really want that idea that we're here for your support. Whatever you need, we're not leading you. You tell us what you need. So I just want to kind of dive into the four different areas that you guys focus on. If we can maybe shed some light on each one separately uh, and why did you guys choose those areas specifically? Yeah, so I'll start with shelters and housing. So we have a youth drop-in center that's open every day of the year. Uh, and many people will have come to the red stoplight outside our, our drop-in. It's just kitty corner across from the Ottawa Mission. So it's very prominent downtown. It serves downtown youth who are street involved, mm -hmm. who are couch surfing, 
who are, some are struggling with addiction, some are struggling with addiction and mental health challenges. They're, most of those young people coming through that drop-in are homeless yeah. and struggling with homelessness or on the verge of becoming homeless. And so they connect with our staff. Sometimes they're connecting, they're coming in to get a shower, they want a hot meal, uh, which we provide, they want to wash their clothes, access you know, the internet, whatever the case. Um, but when they come into the drop-in, they are connecting with a really compassionate staff person. They might not have a really deep conversation that first visit. Second time they come in, they might feel more comfortable. So the more that they come in, the more that they feel they're in a safe zone, they know that it's a safe space. So the drop-in every day of the year is doing magnificent work and also on site is a school. So for a young person who may not uh, have their high school graduation diploma, they can it, they typically won't go back into a traditional classroom. Yeah. Uh, but getting a credit there with a teacher in the room, accessing the uh, curriculum online is so much easier. Mm -hmm. So so that's that's part of our what we call community services is shelters and housing and our our drop in. We own and operate two youth shelters in the downtown core and four long term housing buildings. So for long-term housing, that's really for young people coming out of our shelters that are ready to be more independent. They'll still have staff support, but in a slightly different way. And they're they're just at a, a place where they feel they've got their footing and they might be back in school, working, and able to really manage living on their own, but still with that support. So that's shelters and housing in terms of that area. Mental health, we have many programs under our mental health banner. Those that are really quick access are a crisis phone line and a crisis chat service. So really important. Very interesting and important, actually. If you want to just maybe shed some light on those a little bit, just mm -hmm. to let the people know how to access them. and Absolutely. And, and YSB.ca has all of our services listed there. Really critical spot to, to access. And, and to see how to access our work. But the crisis phone line is 24-7 mm -hmm. crisis chat service, which is mostly used by young people because they're so used to using their phones. That's also 24-7 get connected with our crisis staff. These are not volunteers. They are trained mental health uh, counselors who are answering those calls morning, noon, night, weekends, all the time, middle of the night. And for a young person, we always remind them and for parents because parents are Typically, the ones that we'll call our crisis phone line, whereas young people tend to use the, the chat service, we always tell people, you know, remember that it's a strength to reach out for help. It's not a weakness. And it's something that we've all been learning. I, you know, I think back to my time as a teenager, I didn't really struggle. I mean, I, I, I certainly dealt with bullying and that was not pleasant. I would not have known or thought to reach out to someone to, to speak to other than my mother. But for a young person... You know, sometimes parents are asking a lot of questions and that young person doesn't have any of those answers. They need someone yeah. who who knows how to sit with them, even if it's in complete silence, just to say, I'm here when you're ready. There's a beanbag chair. Why don't you sit there? It's really cool. Check it out. And then we'll have a conversation when you're ready. Uh, you know, that that sort of expertise happens when you have someone who has had those conversations all throughout their career. And so uh, counseling is a big part of our mental health offering. We have uh, youth and family counseling. So sometimes that's a longer stretch, a longer stretch where a young person might come in initially, but then want to involve their family. And so there are multiple sessions of counseling and, and those take as long as they need to take. Uh, we don't say you're signed up for three sessions and and that's it. It's as long as it's as it's it's needed by the young person and and or their families, um, because those families want to know how to support that young person, how yeah. to best support that young person. And for folks that are watching, how are these funded? These programs. So mental health is under the Ministry of Health, and then myself um, and our foundation team, which is a team of four people, we also fundraise where there's any gaps. And so each of our areas are funded by different ministries: community and social services, mental uh, mental health is under um, our the health ministry, and um, and then our other uh, areas are funded by other parts of the ministry, but also through we have support from United Way, we have support from incredible community partners, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, all the way up to our uh, our larger corporate partners. So our foundation plays a role in uh, making sure that we can fund any areas where there's a gap in funding. Yeah. 
And it is definitely a crucial part of the society that we really need to pay attention to because that's the, the future of, of Canada, the future of our city uh, kind of thing. So if we're, we're letting that sort of fall by the sideways, it's definitely going to affect us later on with obviously broken families, broken mm-hmm. homes and things like that. So let's dig in into a little bit more into the other avenues of uh, youth services. So we've talked about shelter so far. We've talked about mental health. Mm-hmm. What about the other two? So another area that we are, are really proud and and honored to offer is a youth justice program. Mm-hmm. So that's for young people who have been in conflict with the law. They're coming to us to serve time. But while they're there, they're getting access to mental health support. They're getting access to employment support so that when they leave, hopefully they will not return to whatever activity brought them to us in the first place. They have an on-site school. We just had two young people. We had a, a note from our director of youth justice uh, just this week saying two more graduates that completed their high school education. And on-site at that facility, uh, and this is for young men 13 to 17 years old, but on-site at that facility is a million-dollar trades training center. So we offer tours ongoing. Uh, I love to bring donors and community partners out to our youth justice facility to see the main justice facility itself, but also our trades training center. That is for young people. Any of those young people that are serving time with us uh, who get access to go in and learn the basics of a trade. It's not pre-apprenticeship level training, but you'd be amazed at the fire in, in the belly that gets created when a young person can make something from start to finish. Amazing. So if you think of a young person who's never had perhaps guidance at home, never shown how to make something, and then all of a sudden they've made a charcuterie board or a buddy bench or uh, a lampshade, a pen with a wood wrapping. It, it's incredible. And they're so proud to show the staff, I, f- I finished it. I finished mm-hmm. this. So, you know, that's, that's a really exciting area. And during the pandemic, a lot of youth facilities uh, in the justice world closed down. And so we had a lot of youth coming to us here in Ottawa. So we've been We've been absolutely full, um, but the staff there, it's a calling. I always say that our staff in all of our areas, really, working with young people, working with really vulnerable youth, it's a calling. It's a passion. It is. It, these are the people that see something in those young people, and they don't give up on them. It's, it's really beautiful to watch. So that's our youth justice area, and then also youth employment, which, as I mentioned, also extends into adulthood. So for the youth uh, justice program, is that sort of like an alternative program so they don't necessarily serve time or like how how does it work? They are serving time while they are with us. Okay. Uh, and for, for all crimes that, that you can you can imagine. So it really depends how long they're staying with us. It's based on what's been given to them by, by the courts. And, uh, and we also have a team that works with um, when young people are going back into the community. It's that reintegration piece. Mm-hmm. We want to keep them... We want to make sure they're still supported. We want to make sure that we don't simply open the door and and out they leave. So it's keeping in touch with those young people. It's uh, making sure they have the resources like our mental health support programs, as well as others in the community. They have connections to our employment services. It's really trying to make sure that, that they've got those supports when they, when they exit that door. And I think it's really important too, that if they've, if they've shown an interest in a trade while they've been with us, we're now offering a couple of bursaries so that they can attend Algonquin College or La Cité to pursue training in a trades because there are, you know, jobs available as well. And how have you been a sort of raising funds for those specifically, those bursaries and, and things like that? Is that something that we can, you know, the audience can help? Absolutely. I think in all of our areas, we uh, we offer different uh, different ways to engage with us, both on uh, from a volunteer perspective. Coming out for a tour is the best way to see where an organization might really have an affinity. They might bring some colleagues and, you know, in, as part of their decision making on a charitable organization that they'd like to support. There's nothing better than a tour mm-hmm. because it really gels. Here's something that we can wrap around. And for example, uh, we had a very a, a difficult conversation with a mom recently who lost her son in a motor vehicle accident. He worked in the trades. He loved the trades. He found himself in the trades. And she wanted to, as a, as a, in, in his memory, really commemorate his life and his love of trades by setting up a bursary. So she's done that recently with us, and we administer that. And it goes to young people who are pursuing, even if they're not fully in a trades program yet, 
but they've got an interest and they'd love to just take a course just to see what area is of, of interest to them. So we do that with all of our programs. We really create packages that uh, a company or an individual or a family might be interested in uh, in investing in, whether it's sponsoring a shelter room for a year. Uh, my family does that. We sat at the dinner table about two years ago and said, what would we like to do as a family? My daughters are older now. They contribute as well. Uh, and so we said, what about we we fund a room at a shelter for a young person who gets to basically rebuild their lives? Really powerful and beautiful. So so we have all sorts of different ways that organizations can engage with us. And for the education piece, sorry, for the last piece, that's the education and uh, employment as well, too. So what does that entail? So employment is also fascinating because we do a lot of pre-employment training, a lot of different workshops. Uh, of course, during the pandemic, we altered all that to be online. And so some of those are still offered online, but really pre-employment training, how to prepare your resume, how to do an interview, how to sit like you and I are sitting and have a conversation and feel confident and know what your messages are that you really want to leave with that person before you leave. How to uh, prepare for, we also do career fairs, so large uh, multi-employer career fairs. We just held one recently where we had uh, we had 900 people registered to come. I think we ended up with close to 700 job seekers attending. Huge. And upwards of about 90 different employers on site interviewing people on site, meeting with youth, meeting with early career professionals, as well as uh, as older adults looking for work. So really hands-on, really uh, low barrier access to getting support in whatever area as young people prepare for the job market. And what are some of the resources that you guys have for specifically for the employment piece? Mm -hmm. So workshops are huge for us. Um, and whether it's in person uh, or it's uh, virtual as well, the career fairs are, have really picked up. So we've been doing uh, several of those every year now that we're in a place where we can bring large groups together. In fact, this most recent one that we did in June, had we had to move to a different location just because of the numbers. So working on resumes, working on interviews, pre-employment training, all the different uh, training pieces that you might uh, think of when you join a new company, all of that can be accessed through us at no cost to the job seeker, which is really important. Also job placements. So, you know, upwards of three months to four months in terms of uh, placements at jobs, but also ultimately we're helping people find jobs, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's in the IT world or in retail, whole range. Uh, we've got upwards of about 600 different employment partners that we work with. And, and and we also work with those employment partners to make sure they know we might have a young person who also struggles with uh, their mental wellness. And so they might need a little extra support. Um, and so those employment partners understand that. Uh, and that's also really important to see that uh, just like any large, small, medium employ employers, they have to be attuned to that, that, that em employees have additional needs sometimes and need that the workplace to be safe. It sounds like from, you know, like just looking at the the four different pillars that you guys serve, you know, you've got your mental health, the justice, the uh, shelter, as well as the employment and education. It sounds like you have a well-rounded sort of approach to youth services from a support perspective. Was that always been the case as, as far as youth services concerned? Or is that something that just kind of evolved over the years? It's evolved over the years. And I think what you said is interesting too, Fatty. A young person might come through one of those doorways, but need support from some of our other services. Mm -hmm. I was just going to actually ask you, what are the chances that someone can use all services and, and how often do you find that sort of happening? It does happen. I think it happens more now than ever before. I think the one area that perhaps is a little bit more unique is that someone coming in with a mental health uh, uh, concern or employment concern or perhaps on the shelter side might not access our youth justice facility because they're not, they haven't been involved in the law. But those young people at our youth justice justice facility will definitely access some of our other supports. So it's it's really unique to have all of our services under one umbrella uh, because one of the things that's sometimes difficult is if an individual, let's say a young person, is struggling in multiple areas, if they go to an organization to get support in one area, 
and then they get referred to another organization mm-hmm. and then another organization. Sometimes it's just too much. Yeah, and it's so like a death by a thousand paper cut kind of thing. That's exactly it. It, it kind of makes it a little bit easier when it's just like one sort of organization owning the process and taking you through the, the journey. That's it. And, I, and I, you know, we don't do everything. Uh, we have really strong partnerships, you know, as we do with the adult shelters, for example. If a young person is 18 and they think, oh, I need to go into to access an adult, adult shelter, those shelters do remarkable work. But that young person might be best to be in an environment with younger people. And so we have such great, strong relationships with other agencies in the city, from the shelters to, you know, mental health supports, the hospitals. We don't do it all. And when we do it best, we're doing it in partnership with others. Yeah. What just, again, like, you know, shedding some light on some of these services, what's the cost of some of these services look like Mm -hmm. for use services and you know, what's what's that ticket item look like kind of thing? We're a $32 million organization. So that is all the funding that we receive from the various uh, ministries for our work. And it's also uh, the money that's raised through our foundation. But as an example, um, a shelter room, to keep and maintain a room at one of our shelters, to uh, turn over a room when a young person leaves and someone else moves in, it's $4,000 a year to keep a shelter room running. Mm -hmm. So that is an example of what we offer to the community or a small business or medium business, a family to say, if you're interested in housing a young person and knowing that they'll have full wraparound support, that's worth $4,000. That's the cost to us to keep that room running every year. Yeah. And then on the flip side, a counseling session, you and I could be doing a counseling session right now. And we've taken that and really understood what is the cost for an hour of mental health counseling. And it's $45 an hour. So sometimes people will say, listen, you know, I can't give a big, I would love to be able to give a big donation or our, our employee group would love to support, but we want something really tangible. Give us some of those mm-hmm. examples. And so, you know, those are the sorts of things that we break down for for folks to understand the investment and the value of that and what what it, what are the outcomes of that investment. Yeah. And then there's something to be said about, like, you know, giving something that's um, tangible and it's a one time donation kind of thing. And it's just it's once and done and you forget about it and, mm-hmm. you know, whatever the outcome comes out of it. It's just a one-time thing where something like, for example, in my opinion, mental health, uh, when you're given up or you're given in for something like that, you know, a, a bunch of sessions, what have you, that to me is like giving for life in a way, right? Because, you know, you're affecting that young person's life by, you know, let's just say as an example, I'm, I'm taking on a young person's, uh, you know, um, sessions for the next six months or so, and that's maybe all they need. Absolutely. Um, you've literally altered the trajectory of their life by doing something like that. Um, so that's, you know, one of the, the reasons why I'd, I'd, I wanted to kind of bring you on the podcast and share with the city what are some of the services that are available for the youth, our youth in the city. Um, and as far as the services are concerned, like, you know, one of the biggest things that comes to mind a lot of the time, especially with, with mental health and stuff like that, is obviously the, the that sense of discretion. What does that look like? How are you guys taking that into uh, effect and privacy? What does that mean to uh, you as services? Privacy is everything. Um, And when you think of a young person, if you think of a 16-year-old or 18-year-old, obviously privacy is very key to them. And it's, it's part of when we tell them it's a strength to reach out for help. It's also confidential services. Unless a young person is being harmed, mm-hmm. then, of course, we have to bring in other experts beyond what we provide. Um, but a, a lot of young people, in terms of mental health, as an example, a lot of young people will, after a session or two, want a little bit of that support for their parents. So their parents can understand how to best support them as well. Yeah. And and as you say, you know, that investment, whether it's, you know, some young people will come in and an hour session is all they need. They've got all the ideas in their head. They really just need to kind of sort through it with someone who is objective and who can guide, you know, their thinking. And uh, so sometimes that one session is all they need. But but if not, then it really is it's continuing that relationship with that counselor. And there is such a bond that is created and it is based on this is just you and I speaking and and 
as I said, if there's a case where someone is being harmed, then of course, uh, you know, we have to we have to uh, bring in that expertise. But but the, those sessions are confidential. They mm-hmm. are confidential, and just as they are with parents as well. Patty, thank you so much for you know giving us your time and and letting us know about this wonderful foundation in the city USB. It's been around for sixty some years, and would love to kind of know a little bit more about it. And for folks that are watching ysb.ca ys, ysb.ca that's, right. that's the, the website um, make sure you go and, and you know take a look at the program and see where you can help it's definitely something that's close and near to all our hearts at the end of the day we're shaping young minds here that are that could potentially go one way or another we have that ability to to divert it we have that ability to kind of help and, and come in at an early stage to prevent that from happening so why wait Again, thanks, Patty. Really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, if you guys like what you see, please hit the like button. Don't forget to subscribe so you can get more and more alerts about episodes like this. And hit the bell icon so you can actually get the alerts right to your email. Thanks again.